welcome food fans, picky eaters, the flavor curious, and everyone in between. Nothing makes good food better than good conversation. And your table is ready. Come right this way to the Food for Thoughtcast with your host, Melissa Reagan. But you can call her chef. All right, let's get this episode started. As a chef and a person who loves all kinds of food, I'm always looking for ways that I can emphasize quality over quantity without feeling like I'm missing out or depriving myself of the things that I love. And I love pasta, carbonara, mac and cheese, primavera, cacio pepe, you name it and I'm all about it. That's why I choose Bonza. Bonza is the pasta made from chickpeas, which means it has more protein, more fiber, and I believe more flavor than regular old pasta. Seriously, if you go in my pantry right now, there are two boxes in there awaiting their next culinary adventure. Bonza has over 12 different kinds of pasta, including penne, rotini, elbows, and cavatappi, which is my favorite, because all of those curves and ridges hold even more delicious sauce. Bonza also makes pizza crust, which tastes too good to believe that it comes from peas. You can find Bonds at Whole Foods, Target, and Walmart. Hey there, food fans. Welcome back to the Food for Thought cast with me, your host, Melissa. You can call me Chef. This week, we're joined by friend of the show and frequent co-host and all-around amazing guy, Chef Steven Gonzalez. What's up, Steve? Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> this week we're talking about comfort food. I want to know all about Yum. it. But first, I have to ask, what's the most amazing thing you ate this week? You know what? Yesterday we did a uh, smoked red snapper at the house and we uh, wow. made a like a pineapple pico de gallo and it started off with like we're going to eat healthy and, and brown rice and vegetables. Now we just made tacos out of that. So that was <laughs> the best thing I've eaten so far this week. The week's not that's... over. There's time to eat more good food. That sounds so good. Um, what did you use to smoke it? Uh, so I have an electric smoker, and I had I used apple wood chips. And nice. I, I don't know why. I know apple's such a heavy uh, smoke, but I just like it. You know, it's that and mesquite. Like those are my two go tos for everything. And it's a bit excessive, but that's what I like. That's what I grew up with. You know. You know, if it's good enough for bacon, then I think it's good enough for everything else. <laughs> yeah, <I> agreed. <laughs> Did you season the snapper with anything special? Uh, I used a, um, I don't have to think about it. What the heck did I use? Oh, yeah, I used a, so HEB's got this like Creole kind of a uh, fish season, seafood seasoning. And I just went simple with that, a little bit of some garlic and chili oil and stuffed it with some lime and rosemary. Oh, that sounds so good. I so I wouldn't have thought to put like, I wouldn't have thought to put Creole flavors with rosemary. Like, how did that play together? I just kind of got this and that and put it all together and said, you know what? It's going to be good. And sure yeah. enough, it was lovely. I love when that happens. It's that or you get like, but but it's like it's that or you get salt, pepper, garlic powder, onion powder, uh, any, and then you start like adding more and more and more, or you have one that's already done put together and you just say, all right, we're going to go with this. Why not? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and sometimes it's an experiment and sometimes you're just using what you have at your disposal and either way, man, that's magic. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, exactly. I love that. So uh, several weeks ago, I asked the listeners on all of our social media platforms what comfort food meant to them or what was their go-to comfort food. So I'm going to share those really quickly. Mm -hmm. Angela over on Instagram said mac and cheese. Rick said cereal. Yeah. Um, Sandra from Hippos and oh. Hash Browns. Shout out. That's a local reference. She's got a bakery in the Casa View area. All the people that live in Dallas, you need to go check her out. She said cookies. 
Yeah. Um, Jen from the Main Street Electrical Podcast said grilled cheese because her grandma made it for her after school and Pop-Tarts because she was a 90s huh. teen, which I fully agree with both of those. <laughs> Steve, here. you said mac and cheese. And you also said when you were feeling stressed out or sad that sushi was your go-to comfort food. It right? really is. I like it a lot too. Um, and then Melissa Thomas over on Facebook told us that it was pizza because it makes her happy and it includes all the food groups. I couldn't agree more. I think it's complete food. Amy said any version of potatoes, but she wasn't sure why. We've got a little science to back that up later on. Um, my mom, who I cannot bear to call by her first name, said potato soup, smashed potatoes with butter, scrambled eggs, baked buttered crackers and then she specified like these are the things i like when i'm not feeling well but otherwise it was sunday roast with potatoes carrots and onions all cooked in the meat juice mm. which yeah, i remember that, having that pretty good. yeah i remember comfy. having a lot as Is as a kid a word? it's not but it should be comforty what what did you comfy. say? It's not a word but it should be it's, it it's is not now. very comforty. I know it's not <laughs> a word, it should be yeah it, it is now. And then my Aunt Rebecca said roast, mashed potatoes, and gravy. Or her other go-to was chocolate. Um, and for me, it's really typically spaghetti or chili and cornbread. But if it's too hot for one of the two of those, then ice cream. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could see that. <laughs> ice yeah. cream is always a good thing. But ice cream is also good when it's cold, too. I don't care. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So I, I won't discriminate against ice cream any time of the year. Um, but there are some times where, I mean, I think next Thursday it's supposed to be 105 here and you are not going to see me cooking or eating chili and cornbread because that's nasty. Sorry. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> you know, I, I drink hot coffee every morning and lately sure. it's been like 100 plus degrees and I just can't, I can't do it right now. I don't know why. So I've been settling for like an ice cold uh, C4 energy drink. And, yeah. uh, you know, I feel kind of like I'm cheating on coffee, but I cannot <laughs> drink cold coffee. I can't do it. It, it just, it grosses me out and it's too hot to, to drink it hot, you know? So uh, uh, I, I don't know what to do. Help me out here. <laughs> well, several cooks that I've worked with in the past swore up and down that when it was 90 degrees or above, that hot coffee would actually cool you down because it would cause you to sweat. Um, even if that is the case, it's too much hot liquid in my stomach when it's that hot outside. And then you combine that with a hot kitchen and it's like, <laughs> there's really, there's really nothing comforting about that. But I totally understand the appeal of, to me, there's nothing as, as comforting and, you know, as, life-giving in the morning when it's 80 or below, right? Than a nice hot black coffee. I love that. Yeah. Agreed. Out here in West Texas, by like 10 a.m., it's already 100 degrees. It's insane. Oh, yeah. Summertime. It's crazy. This has been a crazy year weather-wise. Um, but I do have some science uh, that I want to bring in for comfort food before we get started. And that way, you know, I, honestly, all the research that I did kind of backed up everybody's answers, um, which I think is awesome. So first, the Oxford on, language. Wait, wait. I'm going to guess what that is. No, you hold on. You have to stop. <laughs> I'm going to guess what it is. You're going to guess what, what it is. Be, oh, give me it, your definition. It then. Release, so the science behind it, let me guess. It sure. releases endorphins and dopamine um, and it. I, I, that's that's as far as I got. You're you're not too Am far right? off. So, right uh, so, <laughs> so those would be so endorphins and dopamine would both be the happy the happy brain chemicals, um, and mm. yeah, it's that's exactly kind of what you're going for when you eat these foods. But everybody has their different reasons, right? So, the Oxford Language Dictionary defines comfort food as food that provides consolation or a feeling of well being. They go on to further define this as any food with high sugar or other high carbohydrate content and then or Ooh, associated yeah. with childhood or home cooking. So what do you think about that? Yeah, that sounds pretty spot on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was going to say that, but, you know, not so eloquently. <laughs> well, I right, leave it to Oxford, right? And then the Cambridge English Dictionary says that the comfort food is defined as food that people eat when they're sad or worried, uh, sweet foods, or food that people ate as children. 
what say you? Mm -hmm. I mean, all of the above, really. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can fully agree with everything. Yeah. Every answer we got, right, was either based on, I had this as a child and it makes me sentimental, or these foods make me happy when I'm not feeling well, right? And so, um, yeah. yeah, nutritionist Brian Bender says that comfort foods are comforting because they provide psychological comfort. So I think that works both ways, right? Either you're not physically feeling well, or like you said, you were stressed or sad. And so I even think that your answer of sushi hits that because it's definitely got the carbs. Oh yeah, most definitely. <laughs> I, I can remember being in my twenties. One time I was just, I was just out of it and I don't even remember why, but I, uh, I went and had sushi and I felt a million times better. Like it just really turned my mood around. And ever since then, I thought to myself, you know what, this is, I'm onto something here. So whenever I get real stressed, a lot of people will say, oh, I need to, I need to slam a beer or I need a shot. I'm like, bro, I need a roll of sushi right now. (laughs) Um, the journal of gastronomy and food science argues that comfort food is not always high carb or calorie dense, but they do go on to say that women will turn more often to comfort food when they're, um, you know, feeling guilty or overly emotional or depressed, but men will tend to use comfort food as a reward for hard tasks or high stress times. What do you think? You know what? I could see that. I, I'd never really thought about, you know, women eating comfort food if they feel guilty or anything like that. But it does make some sense. Yeah. And then I do also like to binge a little bit after either a really hard days of work or um, I do some sort of project around the house and I feel really good about myself. Yeah. It makes yeah. sense. Right. You're like, Hey, I earned, I earned this at X, Y, Z, whatever it is. And you, for the listeners, like, Hey, <laughs> We're not psychologists. I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not a dietitian. Just like I told you in the breakfast episode. We do play one on TV. Yeah, right. That's that's not my job, and that's not this podcast. So we're not here to make anybody (laughs) feel bad or otherwise about you know eating what you like, right? Um, I think you know everybody's answers seemed really sentimental. Like these are the things I grew up with. I remember somebody making this for me, and so if somebody made a food that you liked specifically for you, then I think it could make you feel really taken care of. But then again, we also have to remember that, hey, everybody maybe didn't have the greatest childhood. So what do you think about the idea that a comfort food is something you find as an adult? I mean, you think that's possible? It could definitely be possible because because our our food preferences change all the time. Our flavor profiles are always changing. So yeah. I remember growing up loving sugar. And oatmeal cream pies was like my thing when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. And now that I'm older, I'll eat one. And I think Ugh, this is a little too sweet for me. So I can definitely see adults finding either new comfort foods, um, finding something that hits a spot for them. Because, you know, I can guarantee you that when we're in our 40s, our 50s and so on, we're, our food preferences are still going to change. So comfort food is going to mean something else to us in those years, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And it could come full circle. It could be like the older that you get, the more you prefer something that you had as a child because of the memories, or it could be retroactive to your childhood. I was never allowed to have this thing as a child. Now that I'm an adult, I control what I eat. And when I, you know, when I can have these special things and now it's something that I treat myself with as a completely different, like both directions. You said that your ultimate go-to comfort food was mac and cheese. So I want to know, is it crunchy topping? Is it on the stove? Do you add anything in there? Like, tell us all about it. For me, comfort mac and cheese. I'm not a big fan of the breadcrumbs on top. I just, Mm -hmm. it was something that I've discovered in my 20s and I just didn't like it, you know? Um, And a lot of the times it's because it was bland breadcrumbs. Like they never put, like it wasn't seasoned, you know? Uh, for me, I do mine on the stovetop, and I like to add all sorts of vegetables and shrimp and crab. So um, I can remember growing up, my favorite meal was when my mom would make seafood Alfredo. And mm-hmm. so I've kind of, I would always add 
onions and garlic and mushrooms and green onions and broccoli and carrots and all sorts of stuff. And of course, shrimp and the crab with a K. I've taken that and added it to mac and cheese. And to me, it's like an adult mac and cheese, if you will. But it's just yeah. amazing. Like it just comforts me, you know, and even though it's still like a creamy uh, pasta, if you will, and it's just more cheesy, it just puts me at ease just a little bit more, you know? So what kind of pasta and what's going in the cheese sauce? Um, honestly, I like the, uh, I like the whole wheat pasta. Like mm -hmm. it, it doesn't, I'm not a shape person. It doesn't have to be like the elbow mac and cheese or the elbow macaroni noodles, or it doesn't have to be Jamali pasta. I really don't care. I, I right. like whole grain pastas. Uh, I like regular pastas. I'm really, I don't really have a preference as long as the, the sauce itself is on point and you can taste all the extra things that you added to it. I think that's spot on personally. Uh, sim simplicity at its finest, you know, that's what I like right. to say. Right. So are you making like a bechamel, which for the listeners, that's a white sauce or you uh, using good old Velveeta are you using cheddar? What are you, what are you doing? I use a lot of different cheeses, but then I also add uh, cream, a little bit of milk, I, I'm not a big fan of the roux-based sauces for a mac and cheese. I mm -hmm. I don't know why. I just, you know, I, I think because you're adding a, a, a thickened sauce to a pasta that's going to soak up all that sauce even more. So it just makes it thicker and thicker. And by that point, you're, it's almost like you're eating a glue if it sits around for too long. So that's why I just, yeah. like I said, I just keep it simple. Cream, milk, cheeses, and seasonings, you know? Yeah. And, and, you know, what you're referring to is also the process of like the pasta is going to give off its own starch, which is a thickener in and of itself. Mm -hmm. So sometimes if the mac and cheese sits too long on the stove, um, it does turn into that brick and it's really, really heavy. And then also, you know, the amount of liquid you have to add back to a roux thickened sauce for mac and cheese to make it creamy and like stirrable and everything else, then you're just diluting your flavors at that point, I feel. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. I mean, unless you had like chicken broth or something or like some sort of flavored broth stock, something. I mean, a lot of people, yeah, they like to add absolutely. water and yeah, that's going to definitely reduce the amount of flavor that you got there. Well, yeah. I and mean, you did all that work to thicken the sauce with a roux or, you know, even a slurry and you're just destroying all that good work. All those like, you know, networks and molecular bonds that you've created and all that really good unctuousness of the sauce. Like if you're just putting water back in it, right? Yeah. Agreed. I'm always all a right. big fan of also adding bacon to my, uh, to my mac and cheeses too. Like, I don't, I don't know. I just like to get creative and just add a ton of different random ingredients to it. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, like I've learned not to throw, I'm not a big smoked, meat with my mac and cheese mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying like brisket mm -hmm. and mac and cheese is good but like i can't like i have to eat my brisket and then i have to go for a, a bite of mac and cheese like i can't mix them together for some reason it's weird really I not know. together really i'm weird what can i say okay i mean like i said so i like <laughs> that smoky I, I don't know i i prefer them separate you know right um, all right. So if you're making the mac and cheese for yourself, you told us how you were doing it right. But if somebody asked you to bring mac and cheese to a party, would it be the same or different? I would tone it down just a little bit because I know not everyone likes what I like. So I would just keep it real basic um, with like your, your good cheese sauce. I would find out if there's people who can't do, for example, something like bacon or something along those lines. Sure. And I would just kind of adjust to that. You know, but I'm also a big advocate for if you're going to make something that's going to be simple, those flavors better be spot on and it's going to kick people in the mouth when they eat it, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, just because it's simple doesn't mean it shouldn't be like well seasoned, you know, for sure. And like if you're, if, yeah, and if you're going to do something that's on the more simple side of a recipe, your execution better be there <laughs> because there's no gimmicks yeah. or tricks to cover it up. Right. Um, it's just gotta be like mm -hmm. really able to stand alone. Um, so my personal favorite Mac and cheese is Buffalo chicken. 
And I like to add a blue cheese crumbles at the end yeah. of it, but yeah, just shred it up. Um, sometimes I'll use rotisserie from the store if I'm pressed for time. And sometimes I'll bake my own and shred it up with a fork. And yeah, and I know that this is going to make me sound like a plebe, but um, I like Frank's red hot. Like I like Frank's buffalo sauce. Like I just don't, and I don't care what anybody thinks There's about that. There's nothing wrong with that. To be honest. <laughs> no, that's, that stuff is good. I don't care. Yeah, I, I don't care either. Yeah. I'd be like, yeah, no, that's really good. Every time I got to use Frank's, I always add a little bit of some butter, a little bit of some honey, just to kind of balance it all out. Cause I like that vinegar kick, but I can only take so much before I need like some sort of balance. Right. You know? I think I like vinegar more than you the do. And, and, and yeah. I mean, and I've even had it, uh, some iterations of this out, you know, in restaurants where they'll put a little, um, celery and carrot in there to kind of mimic like the wing plate, which I really like just sort of little crunchies <laughs> because that's the thing about macaroni and cheese is if you're yeah. eating as an entree, it can't just be like the same texture over and over to me. Like I'm very much like a texture person. So I'm not going to, you would find me, you know, I'm more likely to eat uh, ice cream with a bunch of mix-ins or a lot of toppings. Like I'm not really going to do like a plain flavor. That's just the same creamy texture over and over. Well, so plain vanilla for me, please. No, really? No, really. <laughs> no, no. no. I Chocolate chip cookie dough. That's my jam right there. Yeah. I was going to say, I was like, I find that really hard to believe, but I know people that like plain <laughs> vanilla ice cream and, and, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. And there's probably something comforting, right? About that, taking it back to the basics, like that kind of most, you know, basic flavor and vanilla is really what helps so many, you know, other flavors taste the way that they are like chocolate ice cream wouldn't oh, yeah. taste the way that it does if it didn't contain vanilla. And so I kind of get that, that comfort food is like simplistic, right. And kind of back to the days of your, um, well, <laughs> a lot of, uh, wing places, if they're using the Franks as a base, they're, they're doing the same thing that you do, right. They're, they're going to put butter and honey in there. Um, yeah, for sure. But yeah, I, like the advertisements say, I would put that on everything because it's delicious. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. so, all right. So cereal was next on our listener recommendations for comfort food. What do you think about this? Do you have any favorites? What I would be very curious as to what cereal it is because there are some that are better than others. For example, life cereal. It's one of my favorites. It's, but like if I, I would imagine that it wasn't like cornflakes you know like I, I highly doubt that that that, that was the comfort food so i'd be curious as to what the what cereal was it the listener thought as comfort food you know right well he didn't specify but i think there's something about you know we looked at these dictionary definitions of comfort food but i think there's something about definitely textures in there and then temperatures and the feelings that everything can invoke, right? So it, it, it's, is it creamy? Is it because of the carbohydrates? Is it because it's warm? Is it the crunch with the cold milk? You know what I mean? Like, what is it? And is it just yeah. because maybe, you know, as a kid, it was kind of your favorite thing? Or is it because it's easy? Is that why, right? Does that provide some level of comfort that, that yeah. it's stressed? Yeah, it's stress-free. So... All of those things. Uh, okay, my yeah, favorite cereal is is O's. Do you know this cereal? Not not <laughs> off the top of my head. Yeah, so it's like O H. Like if you said like O, you know, like the word. Um, and oh, so uh, it's really good. But I think there's about thirty grams of sugar in a bowl, and I just I don't let myself eat it anymore. I'm not like a health nut per se, but it's just <laughs> I would I would want if I'm going to eat something, I want to eat a lot of it. And choosing things with less sugar enables me to do that. So I would, I like to volume eat. So <laughs> when I can. <laughs> now, I guess with all these different types of milk now, are you like just straight up regular milk? Do you do chocolate milk in your uh, cereal? Is it like almond milk? What do you like? Um, I jumped on the oat milk bandwagon for a while. Uh, I was one of the early adopters of soy milk because just as a kid, I didn't really like cow milk and I've never really determined why every once in a while I will get in the mood for, um, chocolate milk, but nah, I, I think there's uh, some lactose intolerance somewhere there. So I've gone through all of the coconut, almond, <laughs> cashew, hemp, 
and I don't mind the I've I've used them for so long that none of them really bother me. Like it's normal for me all the plant based milks. I was gonna say I what? think lately for me it's just been a lot of almond almond milk versus anything else. I I used to love goat milk, but I finally looked at the nutrition facts and there's a ton of sugar in that stuff. And that's probably yeah. why it's so good. But at the same time, it's like, well, I should probably not do this. And even my growing up, I had a cousin who was lactose intolerant. So he would always do the lactate. And I remember thinking, yeah. this stuff's really good too. It's the same thing. It's got a lot of sugar in it, you know? So yeah, I can't really it's just drink that stuff, you know? It's just like anything else. If you're removing something, you've got to add other things back in to make it taste good. And usually that's sugar, unfortunately. And then as yeah. far as the goat milk's concerned, that's because goats are so sweet and cute. And that's not science, but that's just my opinion. So <laughs> I've wanted to well own a played. goat since it's I was true. a child. It, it will never happen, but I've wanted one because they're adorable. <laughs> um, so you Sandra from Hip... City. <laughs> right? Sa but I would never have to mow the yard again. See, it's a win-win. So yeah. Um, yeah. Sandra, Sandra from Hippos and Hash Browns, here in Dallas said cookies. What do you think? Why do you think cookies are comforting? You know, a good chocolate chip cookie can de-escalate any situation. I think <laughs> when it's got that right texture, if it's warm, you know, I, I'm a big fan. So remember how a little while ago I was saying oatmeal cream pies were like sure. my thing. So I, a couple years ago, I made them from scratch and I made the cookies a little less sweet and I made the filling a little less sweet as well. So like anytime that right. you get like the chocolate chip cookies with some sort of like buttercream or some sort of like filling, I don't know why that just, it makes me happy mostly because it's all sugar. But I mean, like I said, if you have that right cookie where it's not too crunchy and it hits all the elements like that I was talking about, I think that's a good thing. You know, like I could definitely see how a cookie could bring someone joy. Yeah. I mean, I think in this instance, it probably has to do with the sentimentality. Like Sandra owns a bakery. So I'm sure that she mm -hmm. grew up baking with somebody in her family. By the way, her cookies are amazing. Her sourdough waffles are even better. It's, it's a really great operation wow. she has over there, that's but good. yeah. Oh, it's, it's really incredible. But um, yeah, for me, I don't like, chewy warm cookies i like crunchy cookies like twill cookies really? linzer yeah shortbread um but i'm not like the underbaked brownie girl i don't like the warm gooey chocolate chip like i want cr crunchy almost on the edge of with a chocolate chip cookie i almost want it on the edge of burnt and i think it's because i like that bitter kind of you know that other flavor that chocolate can take on now if you burn it all the way no thank you and it's like a smell that you'll never get out of your house, but, but right on the edge. Right. So like when I make a chocolate chip cookie, I like to brown the butter because it has that other, that mm -hmm. nutty flavor. Right. And then mm -hmm. I want a super mm -hmm. duper dark chocolate and I want thin crunchy cookies. So, you know what, now that you mentioned like the nuttier flavor of like the, the brown butter, I, you know, I'm a big fan of like sesame I wonder if you could do like a cookie with just a little hint of sesame into it. I wonder how that would come out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like absolutely. Really I about it. Don't yeah. think you, go ahead. No, I was just saying, I, I think that I you can, say, like, if you look at like fortune cookies. Yeah. Like if you look at fortune cookies, they have a little bit of that flavor. Like you do have mm -hmm. uh, sesame cookies and things like that. So I wonder what would happen if you throw just a little bit of sesame oil or something into it, you know? So have you ever seen that the cookie diagram that floats around the internet from time to time? And it says it, it has all these pictures of the, the dough and then the cookies that are completed. And it says like, this one's butter, this one's margarine, this one's coconut oil. This yeah. one's, have you seen mm -hmm. that one? Yeah. So it makes the rounds on like TikTok and Pinterest every now and then, but um, you could probably take the coconut oil variation and do like half of it as sesame. Um, I think, or you could use, um, olive oil is a carrier or maybe like a neutral, like a grape seed or avocado oil is part of the fat because sesame oil doesn't have like a super high smoke point. Um, or yeah. you could, you could, or you could probably use tahini as your fat. So you could possibly do that. I don't see why you couldn't. Huh. Yeah. And you would get, you would get all that sesame flavor. Well, that could be like, amazing. 
<laughs> well, what was the name of the business that you were talking about? <laughs> Hippos and hash browns. They're gonna. These are requests that they need to start <laughs> doing for us. I'll have to reach out to her on Instagram and be like, "I know you don't listen to our show, even though I'd like you to be on someday. I really like your cookies. And now I need you to make sesame chocolate chip cookies." And she's just gonna be like, "Ha ha ha ha!" No. Right? <laughs> uh, <Sesame laughs> it's hilarious. We're on to something. Maybe so. <laughs> Indeed. What were some of the other? Uh... Well, so All what right. Some of the other um, options. Yeah. So Jen said uh, answer, grilled sorry. cheese. So what do you think? Like, what makes a grilled cheese comforting? I think just because it's simple, it's something that we grew up eating. You know, whether you ask anyone, they when they were kids, we all had very picky taste buds. So grilled cheese was the easiest thing because it's bread and it's cheese. And usually there's butter. Um, yeah. And then, of course, as we get older, we pair with tomato soup. And then that becomes like the the staple and the comfort and all that kind of stuff. And then if you go into the field like we did, then it becomes like, oh, we're going to do like this, this different goat cheese. And we're going to add arugula mm-hmm. and, and all sorts mm-hmm. of stuff, you know. And then, oh, but you also have to have this tomato bisque. And, you know, <laughs> so it's not tomato soup. It's tomato bisque. But, yeah. I mean, yeah, I could definitely see that being comforting because – it goes again, it goes back to childhood. So yeah. That you know, while bisque is a specific cooking method in and of itself, that's another one of those three dollar differences. Mm-hmm. What's the difference between tomato soup and tomato bisque? Three dollars, <laughs> right? Um yep. well mm-hmm. I feel like grilled cheese is a blank palette, kind of like eggs or a baked potato. And I feel like it has so many different options, right? Um but yeah, mm-hmm. that it's it's comforting because it's buttery and it's a carb and it's crunchy and it's gooey and it's melty and you know it's there's definitely a, the yeah. sentimental factor there. And then you know I caught some serious heat. So I'm a member of a a Discord server um, for fans of another podcast that's really amazing about movies called the Deuce Cast Movie Show. And several of us in there have our own podcast and we hang out all day off and on. And there's different conversations in there. It's a really amazing place to be. But yesterday for breakfast, I made two grilled cheese and scrambled egg sandwiches and I had ketchup with them. And I caught, I caught a little flack for that. But one guy was quick to mention like, (laughs) Hey, you know, maybe since grilled cheese goes with tomato soup, this isn't the worst thing ever. And then everybody else was like, you're a terrible human being. Not really. I love you guys, but yeah, they were giving me a hard time. So what do you think? Do you, do you do tomato soup with yours? Do you do ketchup? Like, what do you do? I I can't say I've ever done ketchup with it. Um, but I mean, I usually will do tomato soup or some sort of cream soup personally. Um, all those people that were giving you a hard time about it. All you have to do is say, look, I flavored my ketchup. It was a roasted garlic <laughs> ketchup. And, you know, that, you can make it up. But, yeah. It oh, was you're like, well, not. You know, you all don't know anything. <laughs> it right? was not. Well, but. I was thinking about the ways the ways that a tomato goes with cheese. You know, yeah, pizza being a really good yeah. example. So one of the things I like to do with mm-hmm. the grilled cheese from time to time is make it with mozzarella and pepperoni, and then dip it in marinara. I can see that. And here I was just about to ask, what's your favorite? <laughs> uh, what's your favorite grilled cheese? You know. My favorite fancy grilled cheese is brie and blueberry jam and basil with balsamic vinaigrette. That sounds pretty good. That sounds actually like, really, really good. I like it. But I will put a lot of strange things. I, I don't know. I, I feel like sometimes I'm not a good barometer on like what's your favorite thing because A, I never really met a food I didn't like and B, uh, there's nothing that I won't try together at least once. <laughs> so Yeah. I would probably say like for myself, it would be like a caramelized onion and, and a mushroom with like a goat cheese. That would be like, yes. to me, ulti- that's like one of my ultimate uh, grilled cheeses, you know, like any kind of goat cheese, whether it's soft or you get like a goat cheddar or things like that. I think that's just amazing. Yeah, I, I really want that right now, actually, now that you say that. And then <laughs> I wonder how far do you push the limits and the fillings of a grilled cheese before you've actually just made like fancy stuff French toast, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you, 
you have to go light on it because there's nothing worse than if you get like a sandwich or a burger or whatever the case is in this case grilled cheese you take a bite and all of it falls out like that's just the worst thing to me you know um so i think you add just enough to where it's like a thin layer personally yeah i mean the grilled cheese definitely has some caveats to it right it needs to be gooey and melty everything inside it really needs to be hot in my opinion i mean hey everybody you can do 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 what you do right but to me i think the hallmark of a good good grilled cheese is that cheese pull. And so somebody yeah. asked me yesterday uh, in that discord, they were like, what kind of cheese do you use for your grilled cheese? And I straight up craft singles. And I don't, I don't care what that <laughs> says about me in the chef community because they melt well and it tastes good, you know, but it's not what I use on every grilled cheese, but the basic grilled cheese. Yes. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you ask any chef, they're all going to say, yeah, I got American, I got craft at home. I, I mean, only the snobs are going to be like, oh, no, I cannot eat that. You know, like, <laughs> they, can, they can go kick rocks. Like, get the hell over yourself. It's you know, American. We all like, American we all cheese. Like simple foods. Yeah. We all like simplistic food. You know, I have, I think those people who are like, no, no, you can't do that. Like, like I said, just, no, I'm not going to hear it. I don't believe you. <laughs> <laughs> that's the fun thing about food is that everybody can make it personal for themselves. And there's just not a, a mm -hmm. ton of right and wrong, regardless of what you might read on the internet, because listen, I don't know. I'm, I'm here to just, you know, help people enjoy the things that they eat and there's no sense in bashing anybody's <laughs> decisions. So right. um, I'm here to talk about what I like and I'm here to learn about what other people like. And I think that's what makes it even more special. Yeah, we don't have to gatekeep it, you know. You know, <laughs> it's just it's just food at the end of the day. It's it's not brain surgery. We're not right. we're not you know we're not writing laws. It's just food. Um, but Jen's other comfort food was pop tarts. Where do you stand on these? Because I will eat my weight in pop tarts and not even think twice about it. Frosted cinnamon pop tarts with butter. Hands really? Down. So Done. warm, warm, warmed <laughs> up. What? Do you oh, warm yeah. them up? They got to be warm. Yeah, you have to like, because they, you know, I, I like, I like my meals hot, you know, and sure. And uh, it's one of those things like a cold pop tart good, but man, when you get that, that heat to it and then you add that butter and it just kind of melts. Oh my goodness. And, and the thing about like the cinnamon frosted pop tarts is that when they're warm, you can peel them apart and then stuff them with butter even easier. So you don't have butter like going on like the outside, just in the inside with that nice cinnamon filling. Yeah, I've right. I have learned that over the years, and I can eat those quite often, but I don't because uh, I, you know, my my doctor would not be very happy with me if I did. <laughs> right. Um, I think there is something super comforting about I'm the, I am of the non frosted camp when it comes to the brown sugar cinnamon. Pop tarts, and I have never ever been a morning person. So the way that I ate these as a kid was like running for my life to get to the car <laughs> to go to school, right? Or as a snack after school. So I can't tell you the last time a that I owned a toaster. Um, I just kind of had this thing about clutter on my counter. Maybe that's another episode. I don't know. But I've had toaster ovens before. <laughs> the last time I had like a real toaster was probably I would say seven or eight years ago. Um, if I want anything toasted, I just do it in a skillet or under the broiler, but, but I digress. Right. But like, I can't say that I've ever tried, truly tried a warm pop tart. Now a toaster strudel. I was all about that. I was all about that business. Um, like and it's toasty, equally comforting yeah. to me. They're so good, but now they're too sweet and I couldn't even eat one. So I don't know. Yeah, I can see that. It probably has a lot to do with I, the fact I that I, I <laughs> go ahead. The what? <laughs> this probably has a lot to do with the fact that I would always go get the icing packet out of the toaster strudel box and I would just squeeze them directly into my mouth. So I just, <laughs> I just skip too. the middle, man. <laughs> yeah. Just... And then what I used to do is I would take a bite out of like the toaster strudel and then I would fill it up with the uh, frosting instead of putting it on top because I didn't like making a mess and being all sticky. So I would do that too. Yeah, 100%. So for me, it's 
cold brown sugar cinnamon pop tart unfrosted out of the package occasionally on a road trip in the gas station i will be like yes frosted strawberry <laughs> so yeah okay <laughs> I, I i've tried i mean i've tried a lot of different flavors and there's a ton of flavors i've haven't tried because they've been coming out with new flavors over the years but i just never got into like the the frosted strawberry or any of that mm-hmm. the other flavors for me it was always cinnamon frosted cinnamon that was my ride and die you know yeah yeah no i totally get that i think there is something comforting um about it for sure have you ever seen uh <laughs> have you ever seen jerry seinfeld's stand-up sketch about pop tarts <laughs> no i haven't he has this whole bit where he's like talking about line. well I, there i mean it's not so much that as it, it's just the a really good bit of observational humor and he talks about how in the meeting they were trying to decide this this food but they needed it in the same shape as what would come out of the toaster and they were like he he was like we needed this pastry to be the same shape as the box with the same taste and the same nutritional value <laughs> <laughs> So I yeah, I can just picture Jerry Seinfeld doing his thing, you know, pop tarts. What's up with that? You know, <laughs> what's oh. the deal with pop tarts? Yeah, exactly. But it's <laughs> it's really funny. I'll never be able to do it justice. But yeah, he says the same relative flavor flavor and nutritional profile as the box, which is hilarious because I guess if you're eating one that's not frosted and it's just cold, there is a little bit of a cardboard value to that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't even. I can barely say pop tarts anymore because I always have to say it with like a Boston accent, like pop tarts. You know, pop tarts. I don't know why. I just, I can't, yeah, it's always pop tarts. Yeah. It's pop tarts. Yeah, I'm hungry for breakfast. Yeah, pock your pop tart and have they... yard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, just, I almost be, I almost became a Kennedy there for a second. No, you are. All right. So, <laughs> um, so the the other submissions, right? We had from listeners, mainly centered around pot roast. What are your thoughts on this? Is this something that you make from time to time? Did you have it as a kid? We didn't really do a whole lot of roasts, uh, or at least I don't remember eating a whole lot of roasts. Um, but I I can definitely see that because you know it just. It's one of those things where a roast, it takes time. You put love into it. And when it's done just right, like it'll give you that memory of, you know, your your favorite relative or any relative, really uh, making something with love for you. And then, of course, you got that nice, hearty uh, mashed potato traditionally, you know, and maybe like some of the vegetables that, again, were cooked down in like that juice and all that. Like I could definitely see that being comfort food. And for me, that's more of a uh, fall winter type of dish, right. you know, because there's not a whole lot of texture to it and you can always add textures, but I, I do them more when it cools off just a bit. And even then for me, I don't do roasts. I do like the braises, like the lamb shanks and the short ribs and all that kind of stuff. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I mean, I totally get it. I think that, you know, I mean, obviously a, a Sunday night pot roast, is something that comes to America by the way of the traditional British roast dinner. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with family all being in the same place at the same time and gathering with one another, which is depending on the way you look yeah. at it is you could either say that it's that, that really as a tr- tradition has died in America or that it's coming back around. Right. But I think that a lot of mm-hmm. the comfort factor of a braise has to do with, um, how tender it is and the ease with which you can, it's kind of like the set it and forget it type thing, right? Like you don't have to tend to a braise Mm -hmm. all day long. And so for me, I'm like, when I'm looking at a list of comfort food, you know, even online or from what the listeners submitted, right? I'm like one, one common thing about all these is that none of this stuff is hard to prepare or nor does it take a long time. Right. Of when I say a long time, but like, it doesn't take like an act, active you know time right yeah but also look at like the cuts of meat that are typically used for for like pot roast and stuff like that they're rather inexpensive the uh, vegetables are again rather inexpensive let's say again i'm going back to like the mashed potatoes and the roast and all that. like all those ingredients are rather inexpensive especially you right. know, like years ago when we were kids growing up so 
you know, it, it's a meal where, yeah, you, you put a lot of love into it. The whole family's together. You have that experience, but also you're not breaking the bank for a really good and simple meal, you know? So yeah, absolutely. That also ties into it as well from a different point of view. Yeah. When it hits every, it hits like every box, right? Like you have a protein, you've got a starch and you have some vegetables. You have a really nice gravy to tie it mm -hmm. all together. Regionally, you can have all the different, you know, I put this instead of that, or, you know, we use sweet potatoes instead of, yeah. you know, russets, or um, we used uh, celery exactly. and carrots, whereas somebody else might have used like carrots and cauliflower. They might put broccoli with it or whatever. So it, it's customizable mm -hmm. and it doesn't yeah. take a lot of hands on prep time. Right. And I, I think there's a lot of, I don't think that there are a lot of things more comforting than a braise, to be honest. Yeah, exactly. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, things that are creamy, right? Things that are warm, things that are crunchy, sentimental, things we remember from our childhood. Like I think all of these things qualify as comfort food. For me, spaghetti is just, gosh, it makes me happy whether it's hot or cold. You know, <laughs> it really does. I don't think I can do cold spaghetti. But, yeah. Cold spaghetti, cold so leftover ask... spaghetti is one of my favorite breakfast and i don't care that i'm wrong <laughs> i just don't <laughs> you know what i will not judge you for that you know um so let me ask you this so i remember growing up my mom would make two different types of but i almost had biscotti spaghetti it's adorable so anyway, she would do like right and she would do biscotti <laughs> uh, but she would do like a savory one and then when I got a little bit older, she got she heard a recipe to add like raspberry preserves and stuff like that to sweeten it up just a little bit. What is your preference? Savory or just a hint of sweet? I'm going to need you to explain the inclusion of raspberry preserves before I can answer that question. So so my mom, I think she had seen a recipe or something online where someone swore up and down by it. like, oh, it's so much better. It, it, it sweetens it up just a little bit, you know. And so she tried it and it was all right. You know, I remember liking it as a kid because I was like, oh, you know, like I'm, I like sweet stuff. But I remember she would do that from time to time. And I mean, it's it's all right, but I prefer like savory stuff. Like I've like I said, and I've heard and my mom's not the only one who's done that. Like I've seen a lot of people, you know, do that where they add just a little hint of sweetness to because they say oh well the, you know it'll help complement the tomatoes and the acidity and stuff sure. like that you know what i'm saying yeah so that's where that kind of comes into play well i definitely grew up in the time of like you need to put a pinch of sugar in your spaghetti sauce to cut the acid um any yeah. italian would just lose their mind over <laughs> this however but you kind of have to you have to like call you know you have to compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges right so we're talking about american mm -hmm. spaghetti and if you're using like jarred sauce which hey newsflash for everybody i don't make my sauce homemade every time i use every time i make spaghetti and and then also i probably oh, never make it yeah what? i know just just calm down steve <laughs> it'll be all right but i and also it depends on what i'm in the mood for right like this most recent batch i made was vodka sauce and then sometimes mm -hmm. i want you know chili flakes in there like more like an arrabbiata um just kind of never in the mood for this right i, I don't eat the same things there's always just a little a little bit of a tweak which is really a problem for a person like me because somebody's like oh can you make this thing again i'm like i don't remember what i did you know <laughs> like <laughs> i'm like the yeah. stars aligned um mercury was in the microwave or whatever and uh i don't remember exactly <laughs> what i did i didn't write it down um you know, the tastes just evolve over time. So I'm definitely more on the um, acidic side, but more the savory side, like anchovy paste, olives, capers, yeah. um, chili flakes, you know, a little drizzle of balsamic vinegar at the end. And, and it, you can add that sugar in there by way of red wine. If you are like deglazing vegetables, if That's you're making true. your, yeah, if you're, if you're making your own, I mean, and it's going to add more acid too, to be fair, but um, I think you can get the desired effect in, if you're not a person that uses alcohol in cooking or drinks alcohol, you can accomplish the same things by just caramelizing the onions at the base of the sauce. But I don't think white yeah. sugar is really the way to go. But now you really have me curious about this preserves thing. 
So my mom's my mom's gonna listen to this and be like, I never did that. How dare you? Your mom's gonna listen to this? But oh. that's what I remember. <laughs> yeah, my mom listens to the podcast. Oh, that's but, sweet. Like there, there's some things where she'll say, wait a minute, I don't remember doing that. And I or at least I remember my how I remember it, you know? Yeah, well, that's but that selective I, parent I, I memory that like, happens to that one. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> I, I don't know. Like, I, I like to make it a lot more heavier on the oregano and the, the roasted garlic and that kind of stuff, you know? I, I also remember I used to add in, like, mushrooms and, and the olives and all that kind of stuff because, you know, I can't just keep it meat and sauce, you know? So... Yeah. yeah. I mean, sometimes me. sometimes I don't even put meat in mine, to be honest. Sometimes it's literally just noodles and sauce if I need something fast. And um, I really still haven't yeah. figured out why why I find it so comforting. But um, I just do. <laughs> it's so good. You know, when we were in culinary school, that was my go-to like almost every other night, only because it was cheap, it was easy to make, and it was fast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I remember eating a lot of spaghetti back in culinary school. I could have, you know, I could have made other stuff that I learned throughout, you know, from class earlier in the day and things like that. But I just, you know, I ate a lot of spaghetti when I was, you know, 18, 19, you know? Yeah, I hear so that. I, I mean, anymore, but I still eat it from time to time. I, I ate a lot of ramen, too. Uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, you know, it's it's uh, something about it from time to time. I'll still want it. But now I'm upgrading yeah. it like like an egg or fresh vegetables or, you know, leftover lunch meat or, or whatever odds and ends. We'll yeah. need to do an episode yeah, about, exactly. I think we'll need to do an episode about jazzing up convenience foods at some point. I think that could be a whole thing. Um, Did you say <laughs> you would throw lunch meat in yours? Yes. <laughs> I, I heard that right, right? You said, stop judging well, me. Ron's Why are you judging? Salty enough as it is. And you're adding Why? even more salt to <laughs> Hey, let Hey, listen here, buddy. I didn't say I, I was using the entire seasoning packet. I'm well aware that it's like 4,000 milligrams of sodium. Like, I got it. <laughs> so you use the, you use the lunch meat as your seasoning. Got it. There you go. I I would I would take like you leftover, you know, That's the in, the ends of green onions and like shredded up turkey and like one egg, you know, and I'd soft boil it and then just do like half of the packet of uh -huh. seasoning and yeah. Nice. So yeah. So I no, very I much consider that, that a comfort then, food. So, so. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know, you ramen, can eat your ramen, you can ramen eat... noodles are good. I don't care. They, oh, know, they're so good. Huh? They're so good. I, they're so good. I mean, you. I was just going to say you could eat like three times the amount of sodium you're supposed to have in a day to just drink a bunch of water afterward. If you're not doing it every day, it won't kill you. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> please, please, everybody. I'm not a doctor. Okay. Right. <laughs> But you did play one on this podcast. I did play one for like two it's seconds. It's a lot of salt, podcast. yes, but it's so good. Yeah, but it's just so good, you know. Like I, that's just what makes ramen so cheap to make. That you know, you can you can eat it and not break the bank. So yeah, I mean, ramen it's fast. Ramen could be another comfort food. I, I think it totally is a comfort food, um, whether a lot of people want to admit it or not, because it's fast, it's easy, it's cheap, right? It ha It's full of those really comforting starchy yep. carbs and then that kind of hot bowl of soup. Now, I know people that go the other way, too, and they don't put any of the mm -hmm. broth in it. They just make noodles. They just make, like, the flavored noodle. So. Yeah. Yeah. My wife is like that. She'll She'll do, like, She'll go get the spicy beef noodle soup, but she doesn't want the noodles. And so I'll order whatever I order, and then I'll take her noodles off to the side. And huh. it makes me happy, you know? So, <laughs> yeah. Um, to me, that's, there's also something. <laughs> well, yeah, but along those same lines, there's also something inherently com comforting about takeout Chinese food, like Americanized Chinese food. It's just all the rice and noodles. Yeah. I've been craving that lately. I don't know why. I'm actually going to yeah, eat it tonight. I see that. I've been I'm eating that tonight. <laughs> all, you know, like Panda Express and all that other stuff too. I don't know why. I'm not going to eat it tonight, but I have been craving it over the last few weeks. So yeah, uh, I, I'm I'm going yeah, to satisfy I, that craving that. tonight, <laughs> and I'm I'm going I'm very much considering it comfort food because I've just been I've had chicken lo mein on the brain for quite a while for whatever reason. So. <laughs>
still need to figure out what I'm going to do for dinner. But, you know, I'm sure we'll throw something together. <laughs> it happens. What I other, mean, that's one of my favorite things. Did you get? I'm curious. So those were basically it. Of course, my mom said potato soup, smashed potatoes with butter, scrambled eggs, and then baked buttered crackers. And then she she like further went on and was like, hey, these are all the things I eat um, when I'm not feeling well. And I used to, too, as a kid, whether it was because I you know, okay. had to do everything my mom did because she's totally cool or if it really did make you feel better. I mean, and that's how I feel about chicken soup, too, but I don't seek it out unless I'm feeling bad. But I think soup's definitely... Uh, could be a comfort food. Now I have a friend, um, Aussie Nate, that's in that the discord that I was telling you about. And he says, mm -hmm. quite frankly, that soup is not a meal. <laughs> so I mean, it can I think be. it, I mean, I think it depends think so. on the kind of no. soup, but I totally see where you're coming from, Nate. I totally get it. I, so, so growing up in a Hispanic household, my mom would do like chicken soup. But she would yeah. do like, you know, the bone, the bone in and all that for more flavor. And she would throw like the corn on the cob and they're still on the cob. And right. it was always really good. But the, my problem was that I hated burning my fingers trying to eat the corn real fast or trying to like bite the meat off the, the chicken. So even though it was really good, I, I felt bad when I told her it wasn't my favorite for that reason. Yeah. But I mean, flavor, it was always spot on, you know? Well, it wasn't, but, it, maybe I mean, it wasn't, also, it wasn't a meal. It was an event. <laughs> yeah. <maybe. laughs> yeah. But like also, and then being in my twenties, uh, for us, when you don't feel good, it's menudo, you know? Like, yeah, of course. Menudo, and it, it just a good cure for like, whether you don't feel good or you're hung over. Or, or you're hung over. You know? Yes. Right. So, well, I, I think it depends on the cultural tr tradition that you come from. Right. So, yeah. If, you know, if it's uh, your heritage, right, there are a couple of soups that are considered meals. But if somebody didn't grow up that way, I can see how they would be like, this isn't food. This is like the food that you eat before you eat the actual food, right? <laughs> yeah, so I can see that too. Oh, I was just going to say for us, soup is breakfast, lunch, dinner, and dessert. Not really, but <laughs> you know, soup is, I like soup. I don't, I think they're amazing. Like they're filling. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I totally get it. I think it just depends on what you grew up with and how. Um, well, I was just going to tell you on the mac and cheese. Do you remember Marcus Samuelson from the Food Network? I think he was on Iron Chef America. Um, he has a restaurant in Harlem called Red Rooster that I got to try while I was in New York. And he actually has an entree on the menu that's mac and greens. And it was incredible. It was collard greens with smoked turkey mm. in the bottom of a cast iron skillet. And it was topped with mac and cheese. What do you think about that? Sounds pretty good. That sounds like it's just gonna, you're gonna have to like walk out very slowly because you're gonna be so full. <laughs> so I would imagine, I would hope that the portions are small so that way you have just enough to fill up, feel happy, and still be able to function afterwards, you know? But that sounds really good though. Well, yeah, totally. I mean, if, but if you, if you, uh, if you walked all the way from Harlem back to, uh, you know, Madison Square Garden, you could walk it off, but it's definitely a stretchy, pants type meal. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. That sounds like it. Yeah. A hundred percent. All right. Well, Hey Steve, where can we find you in all the online spaces? Well, if you're looking for me on Facebook, chef Steven Gonzalez, if you go to Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok, chef Stegons, or just go to chef Steven Gonzalez.com and yeah, follow me. Have fun. Let's talk food. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for listening, everybody. This has just been our little look at comfort food. Sound off. Let us know if we missed anything. Maybe you didn't have the chance to give your feedback beforehand. We'll get to you on the next one. Thanks a lot. That's a wrap for today. Until the next episode of the Food for Thought cast, make good food, eat good food, share it, and be kind to one another. Thanks so much for listening today. You are part of what makes us special, and we are so glad you joined us. Don't forget to rate, subscribe, and leave a review. Just like food, delicious podcasts are better when you share them with others. Come back for seconds wherever podcasts are served, and we'll catch you in the next episode of the Food for Thoughtcast.
You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at the Food for Thoughtcast or at www.foodforthoughtcast.com, where you can link to all podcast players, or you can send us an email at foodforthoughtcmc at gmail.com.